Awesome. All right. The Douglas, Doug Douglas Dialogues aims to create a space for students of all political and philosophical backgrounds to discuss what they find to be the pressing socio-cultural and political issues of the day. We advocate for and believe that open and honest dialogue regarding the different approaches for interpretation of these issues is the best way forward in making the world a better place. Our club is open to any Lehigh student. Our members aren't pre-selected by their political beliefs or majors, but only their interest and curiosity in the affairs of the world. We meet bi-weekly and discuss topics our club members democratically decide to talk on. If you'd like to be part of the club, just send me a message and shoot me an email at dmc223. Um, also, uh, you can just throw your email at the, in the chat at the end of this meeting and uh, it can pull from there. Um, another big focus of our club is to invite speakers who are experts on topics we find pressing and that we may not know much about. We want to create a space where students can listen and are able to contend with those very ideas from academics who have worked on them. Today, we have our eighth speaker event so far, and uh, Professor Driscoll has already spoken with us, but Professor Deo is our uh, 10th speaker with the Douglas Dialogues. Um, so I am going to hand it off to Rehan to do the introductions. Yeah, so um, I'm Rehan, I'm the president of Douglas Dialogues, so now I'll introduce the professors. So Christopher Driscoll is Assistant Professor of Religion Studies at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. A scholar of race, religion, and culture, Driscoll has written and lectured extensively across the U.S. and international topics related to white European and American religious and philosophical traditions, hip-hop culture, and mountain cultures. Some of his publications include White Lies, Race, and Uncertainty in the Twilight of American Religion, Method as Identity, Manufacturing Distance in the Academic Study of Religion, and the upcoming Who You Calling Devil, White Men, Black Gods, and Religious Codependency. At the risk of oversimplifying the range of his interests, Driscoll's work forcefully inserts whiteness as an analytic into a range of otherwise seemingly disparate intellectual spaces, working to concretely give attention to the look of white racial identity historically, while maintaining constant awareness of the complications arising from the application of such analytics. And now I'll go to Anani Deo. She's a associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Lehigh University. Her research is at the intersection of religion, feminism, and social movements in South Asia. Professor Deo's first book, The Politics of Collective Advocacy in India, was co authored with Duncan McDewey Ra and focused on the gains of NGOs networkly trans and transnational network networking transnationally. Her second book, Mobilizing Religion and Gender in India, the role of activism compares the rise and fall of women's movements and religious nationalism as an outcome of activist strategies as they respond to changing political structures. She's currently working on two projects. One is a collaboration with scholars in India and the Netherlands to investigate the ways in which society organizations in India engage with the advocacy today. The other maps collaboration between corporations and NGOs in India in reshaping the development sector. So I think these two speakers are perfect to talk to us today about today's topic. So um, now we'll have Professor Driscoll speak for about 15, 10, 15 minutes, and then Professor Deo. So take it away, and then we have our Q&A. Great. Thank you, Rehan and Declan, um, for the invitation. I, like I was saying earlier, it's uh, great to participate in the Douglas Dialogues because I really believe in what you guys are, are about. You know, free exchange uh, is so vital right now in this time when no matter the age, no matter the uh, political persuasion, you know, so many of us are locked in this weird recalcitrance, you know, that, that just won't let us let go of that feeling that we are right and everyone else is wrong. And uh, this is, a, this is, I think, the, the, the step, the step, I say it that way, um, difficult dialogues in so many ways amounts to the step uh, out of that recalcitrance. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate. All right. It's also really good to um, be in conversation with Nandini Professor Deo. Um, I always like to uh, exchange ideas with you. A couple clear or corrections. I am now associate professor. So uh, that's worth noting, I think. And um, then the title of one of those books that'll be out now in uh, several weeks has changed to uh, white devils, black gods, race, masculinity, and religious codependency. So with that, I will um, 
get into my remarks and uh, my remarks are mostly um, involving how we think about what white supremacy is. I know next to nothing about Hindu nationalism, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, being educated and, and uh, engaging in conversation about that. But of the white supremacy stuff, I can, I can say a few things. And so um, that's what I'll try and do. What I want you all to consider is how white supremacy can be understood as one, an ideology, two, a social structure, and three, a history. Uh, and so as an ideology, white supremacy, and this is kind of the most acute, narrow way of defining it, refers to a set of beliefs and practices that valorize the culture, history, and phenotype, that is the physical characteristics, of groups historically regarded as white. That's a complicated concept, though. The, the definition of this ideology is not, but what white means is, is where um, the rub is found. Thought of as an ideology, white supremacy, according to my work, lots of other people's work as well, it works a lot like a religion. That's why I'm using the word ideology. Um, there are fanatics and there are religious zealots within white supremacy, just as there would be of any other religions. There, those, might, those you might think of as the ones who maybe would get a swastika tattooed on their chest. They're, these are the hardcore white supremacists, the ones you think of when you think of uh, hate groups and things like that. But white supremacy as this ideology is more complicated than that. And there are also, you might think of as fair weather believers who get caught up in the emotional catharsis offered when the zealots are victorious in one way or another. That might be in a political uh, campaign. It might be on television. It might be in any number of ways. These are folks who could be swayed in one direction or another, but because white supremacy is this ideology, it is there always, more or less, for folks to be swayed by it. Uh, as a, a cognate illustration, there are folks who only go to Christian church on, on Christmas and Easter, right? That doesn't make them any more or less Christian. It just makes them a different kind of, it had, they have a different relationship to that ideology of Christianity. The same holds true of white supremacy. My point, um, is that while it's important to do the kind of work that, for instance, the Southern Poverty Law Center does in tracking acute hate groups, my work doesn't really do that. As a religion or as a religious disposition, the ideology of white supremacy is not something that is turned on or off based on group affiliation. Like, as I was saying, like American Christianity, with an American Christianity, parenthetically, is in decline in terms of its membership. It is waning on a lot of different registers. The same holds true for white supremacy, but that doesn't mean that it's not a problem. And it does, I don't mean to over emphasize the connection between these two either. In part, there is a historic connection I'll talk about in a moment, but mostly this is just a, a parallel, uh, a proxy example for, for how we think about white supremacy. So, I say this to my students a lot, just because you don't believe in God or the gods doesn't mean the gods don't believe in you. That's how ideology works. What I mean by that is it has a certain kind of impact on us, whether we want it to or not. Suppose you quit going to church, you could think of this analogically in terms of white supremacy or in terms of uh, American Christianity. It doesn't mean that that institution or that the ideology that that institution is built around doesn't still uh, exert a considerable influence on you, both positive and negative, in all sorts of different ways. So first thing, this ideology notion, white supremacy ought to be thought of as this ideology. But it's not only that, it is also what you can think of in structural terms. And here I'll use the term uh, social structure to refer to it in this way. 
And what I mean by this is that white supremacy also can refer to the demographic and statistical information we have today that indicates that historically identified white people retain the bulk of power, authority, and resources in the Western world, in particular in the United States. I'll limit what I'm saying to the US for this case. For instance, I'm, you see, I'm, I didn't dress well for this occasion because I'm in the American West. I'm teaching as part of the Lehigh Launch Program, which is an amazing thing. I, I love Lehigh for letting me do this, but I'm, I'm in the middle of Wyoming. And uh, that's why I'm dressed like this. I've been in the dust all day. Um, but my point in this is just the other day, I was in Yellowstone. There is an abundance of wild spaces across the West and across the US in general. An example of white supremacy in this social structural form it is here, for instance. There are more spaces set aside for national parks and wild spaces to be preserved, pristine, than is held privately by African Americans in this country. Just one kind of isolatable statistic. There's countless others of those, not just vis a vis land and things of, of that sort, but with respect to power, authority, and resources. Who has those things and who has access to the transmission of those things from one space to another? In that regard, white supremacy is still with us. This is one of the ways that it, it believes in us, whether we still believe in it or not. This is one of the things that's difficult to convey to a skeptical audience. And by skeptical here, I don't mean skeptical with respect to belief in God, but skeptical with respect to belief in white supremacy. A lot of the folks who folks on one side of the aisle might say are racist are folks who genuinely don't believe that that's a thing that they are involved in. That makes it difficult to have conversations like this. Um, in terms of the social structure, I think it, it there's ample literature from sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, uh, all sorts of folks who are not doing it, doing this work because they're activists first, you know, they're, they're scholars first, they're following the data. There's ample data that suggests that in this social structural regard, white supremacy is something that is still with us and that we have to actively confront for those of, who are politically motivated and want to see it go away. Um, so that's the second way of thinking about it. The third is where m it dovetails most with my work, and that is thinking about it in terms of history. And this is where I might geek out. I want to convey as a history, thinking of it as a history, I want to convey the tension that exists between it thought of or it expressing itself as ideology and the social structures that are produced as a result of the belief and then the practices that um, emerge from that ideology. That is over time. Um, I want to emphasize what is a somewhat complicated idea that the history of white supremacy involves an effort to find ourselves, and here I'm speaking on behalf of white folks, an effort to find ourselves in history. So that is like a if you know the concept of a meta analysis, this is where that comes in handy it is two levels of analysis are necessary at the same time. So that requires some context from at least the 15th century, the ideology of white supremacy came to matter for the people in Europe at this point in his that point in history, white supremacy and Christian supremacy were ostensibly working in tandem. This is one reason why my earlier analogy is clunky, in part because it's more than analogical. These things were, in fact, deeply interwoven, Christianity, Western Christianity, and white supremacy. And that's not a jab at Christians. That's history. You can, you can see this. It's not, it's not some, that's not a political statement that I'm making. Anyway, they continued to be interwoven, enmeshed in that way up until the 20th century, and some uh, would say that they're still enmeshed together, but Christian nationalism and Christian chauvinism, along with 
the technological innovations of weapons and the invention of the caravel. You guys know what that is? That's the, the boat. It's the one that was the technological innovation that made conquest possible. It's a little boat, but it was deeply influential. All of that enabled the age of conquest. And through that conquest, the belief in Christian or slash white supremacy became a reality. What I mean here is that there was the ideology that was in place. But then through historical circumstance, as well as belief in that ideology, all of a sudden by the 18th century and the 19th century, especially, you see the British Empire, there's not a spot in, across the globe, right, that the British Empire, the sun never sets on the British Empire. A big question in regards to white supremacy is how did that happen? Well, the things we believe in have the capacity to impact our, our actual concrete circumstances. And we can see, we can chart how that happens. Um, another of the important weapons, you might say, with respect to conquest and colonialism is monotheism. Uh, and I can talk about that more in the Q&A, but in short, the history of white supremacy shows a transformation of a set of ideas about how the world should be organized into a world that was organized around those beliefs. In other words, to take stock of what white supremacy is it requires an understanding of the way that the things we believe and what we do with those beliefs has a, a, a huge impact on the reality that gets formed around those beliefs. The belief was made manifest through conquest and dis destruction. Uh, it's an open question whether or not contemporary history still might register to us as the history of white supremacy. That is, think of it in terms of a paradigm. Are we still in a paradigm of white supremacy? We can own up to how in structural ways white supremacy is still something we have to confront. But is, is this hegemonic kind of paradigmatic relationship to the world still in place? As a question I think is worth asking. And if it's not, that doesn't mean there's an end to problems. And this is where the kind of basic question that we might pose in the Q&A is, is notable, right? Like, is, is everything bad that happens in the world right? Is it all coming from that? Or, it, or can everyone be supremacist, you know? Like, does it, does it play favorites in that way? Um, and to be perfectly frank, the people who are involved in the discourse of white supremacy haven't been the best on equitably answering that question. But that's, that's a soapbox for another day, perhaps. By way of conclusion, though, um, I want to offer a short segue between the history of white supremacy and Hindu nationalism. And this will extend as far as I can speak to uh, Hindu nationalism. But I think it's really fascinating, and it's something that not many people really know much about these days. So across the 19th century, many white Western scholars were motivated to find the origins of the white race. Today, we know that the white race doesn't really exist in any biological or ethnic way. It does in a cultural way and a historical way, but it's not a biological fact. There's nothing that we can look at that is a white ethnicity. Even though when you look at me, everybody knows that's, that's the thing that you're supposed to call the folks that look like me. Um, Every, in the 19th century, everywhere scholars would turn, at, they, while they were looking for where we came from, they would find a new ethnic community that had been living where they were found for centuries, if not millennia. But they never found where white people came from. To this day, we don't know what's called the autochthonous. That's the, the reference for someone, for a community that is that has a homeland that's existing in the place where they're from. There's no, no such place has been found for white people. And it was a boogaboo in the 19th century for so many scholars. They were motivated for lots of different reasons, but uh, early anthropologists, philologists, they developed a theory we refer to today as pi. It's called, that's the theory of proto-Indo-European origins. 
And what these folks did was by relying mostly on an, on a set of assumed family relations between different languages, they would use a, a linguistic family tree as a kind of baseline rubric for moving backwards across time and space, looking at one white group, another white group, as well as all the other, other groups, and they would try and organize their thoughts around where white people could possibly be from. They would overlay cultural information, religious information, geographic information, and other kinds of information that was increasingly being gathered and, and uh, kind of organized by the burgeoning field of anthropology. They would put that onto this linguistic family tree and they would follow the commonalities based on percentages. Some of this included religious information, such as the importance of caste and the importance of color and phenotype within certain Hindu traditions. They, lo it, they looked at the Hindu caste system and thought, this looks similar to how we think about ourselves in certain respects, but because it also fit within how they understood the commonalities across the languages, the transmission and the evolution of language, they said, oh, maybe that means that white people emerged ultimately from the Indus River Valley of Northwestern um, India. Now, remarkably, it is true that white people aren't from Western Europe. Not many people know this today, but many people 150 years ago did know it. There's reasons, there's a history about why we lost track of this history, and it involves the motivations largely for why people were doing this work. But it really is the case, even to this very day, we don't know where white people came from. This is fascinating to me. This is where I geek out. Like, why don't we know this? Why can't this, why can't we make sense of this? What we know is that uh, about 4500 BCE, there starts to be a series of uh, transformations. We can track archaeologically that an invader race, you could think of it that way, that's how they were thinking about it, moved through Europe and replaced. It's called the Kurgan replacement hypothesis. And essentially, they replaced the Europeans who did live there, and they, what were left were assimilated into the new community. And there are lots of folks who, in the 19th century and into the 20th, thought that the ultimate, or the Urheimat is what it's called in German, the, the origin place for where this community of in marauding uh, horsemen, essentially, where they came from was the Indus Valley. We don't have adequate evidence to support that unless we give adequate weight to things like religious commonality. Does something like caste parallel adequately to something like uh, anti-Black racism, for instance? And can we rely on that kind of information in order to conjecture that this is where white people emerge from, for instance? Today, I'll, I'll shut up with this. Today, um, the only folks who are really still thinking one way or another about the theory of proto-Indo-European uh, I, language are linguists who some of them are still interested in figuring out where the languages come from. But almost across the board, everyone has stopped asking the question of where white people come from. And it's, again, there's a history of why and how that has stopped happening, but it, it, we didn't stop asking it because we finally answered it. We stopped asking it because the consequences of that theory uh, were expressed in things like national socialism in Germany. That this theory is why someone like Adolf Hitler and Nazis were interested in something like a swastika. Before that, before that, there would be it would have been a non sequitur, kind of like um, um, a hard pivot away from anything white folks cared about one way or another. But this symbol was appropriated uh, in no small part because of the belief the cultural belief in this theory. And today, and this is the last thing I'll say before I uh, throw it over to Professor Deo, is practically the only people who are handling at all the kind of information that I'm conveying to you here. I don't mean to valorize what I'm doing. I don't mean it in that way at all. But essentially, the only folks who continue to talk in terms of 
uh, white origins, whether they think they know where white people come from or whether they're interested in finding out where white people come from, are white supremacists. Those are the, 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 the OG variety, the kind we think of when we think of the term white supremacy. That for me is dangerous because every community, this is why so many folks, not the only reason, but one of the reasons folks were motivated to figure out where white people come from. Whether we like it or not, whether we rationalize uh, it through our sophist cultural sophistication or not, people need to feel like they know where they come from. And I personally think it's a dangerous thing to simultaneously not know where a community is from, but also have it within the kind of cultural ethos that it's inappropriate to be looking for where we come from. It's a recipe for disaster if we look at history. And so with that, um, I've extended, I've overextended my time. So uh, yeah, I look forward to, to what follows. Thank you. Wow. Um, I feel like I have a lot of questions and I want to hear more about this. Um, and initially my motive in hoping that I could hear what you had to say first was so I could, you know, like make some smooth connection, but <laughs> I'm not sure I'm not sure I have that. Um, so I think let me start with I'm I like I do not want to uh, like make very strong assumptions, but I'm going to guess that most people are much more familiar with white supremacy than they are with Hindu nationalism. So I'm going to do just a little bit of like, what is Hindu nationalism? Like, what do Hindu nationalists believe? And what kind of power do they hold? Um, and if this is repetitive for anyone, forgive me. Um, but Hindu nationalism is a relatively new ideology. Um, it was really born in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and it was very much influenced by um, what was happening in Europe. So um, less than the, um, the uh, sort of German uh, model, uh, Hindu nationalists were really interested in the Italian model of fascism. So Mussolini was a real uh, inspiration for them. And um, Hindu nationalism was born in a town um, in, uh, which was really in the center of India called Nagpur. And um, it was organized initially as um, a kind of an, like, almost like an, uh, like a grown up version of like the Boy Scouts um, is how they thought of themselves. But it was really meant for um, boys and men from um, the, the uh, most dominant caste. So these were Brahmins. Um, and so it was these um, Harashan Brahmin boys and, and young men. Um, who were trying to organize and they were organizing themselves and doing like they would do like calisthenics and stuff and exercises and march in formation and wear uniforms and the idea was that um, you know the fact of um, Muslim rule over India and uh, that being followed by um, British colonialism was all supposed to be uh, evidence that uh, Hindu masculinity had sort of fallen into crisis, right? And so the need um, of, uh, of society was to kind of have like these re-energized uh, masculine Hindu men um, who would be able to stand up uh, for the nation and be able to stand up for themselves. And, um, and so the most direct route to doing that was to kind of march in formation and, and like, do exercises together. Um, and, uh, Interestingly, Nagpur was also um, the hometown of uh, B.R. Ambedkar, who is the most uh, well-known um, and influential uh, Dalit leader in India. So, um, you know, uh, Professor Driscoll has already mentioned caste and the caste hierarchy. So the Brahmins are the ones who kind of get Hindu nationalism going, and the Dalits are the people who are at the bottom of the caste hierarchy. They don't have caste. Um, and so, they, like, historically, they were untouchables. Um, but Nagpur is where they start to mobilize and organize um, and push back against the caste system and demand 
political um, rights and political recognition. And so the birth of Hindu nationalism happens at the same moment that um, this historically most disadvantaged um, group of people are also starting to organize and mobilize. Um, what's and this is important because um, I think a lot of people tend to think about Hindu nationalism as really being um, directed against Muslims and against Christians. And it certainly is that. But um, a number of scholars have pointed out that actually, like, in some ways, the real anxiety of Hindu nationalism is about um, the fragmentation and the disintegration among Hindus themselves. Right. So if um, uh, what, so also what's helpful to, to think about is that the um, that the dominant caste Hindus only make up about 15 percent of the Hindu population of India. Right. So almost everybody else um, is not part of this dominant caste and um, Dalits themselves are about 20 percent, um, 20 to 25 percent um, of Hindus. Right. So if they stop being categorized as Hindus, then in any kind of electoral um, democracy, right, um, that's a pretty significant uh, loss of votes. Um, so again, Hindu nationalism is also this very modern ideology that is forming at a time when India is looking to become independent, as it's looking to become a democracy. And so these numbers matter. Right? how much say you have in the process of decolonization and how much say you have in the process of what like, the new India is gonna look like depends on who you speak on behalf of. And so if you speak on behalf of you know, like all Hindus, you have a different weight than, um, than otherwise. So that's kind of the, the context in which and the nationalism is born. It's gone on to, for a long time, it was um, like it was a, an ideology that was out there, but it wasn't really very mainstream. Um, in the late 1980s is when that shifts. So late 1980s and 1990s, um, Hindu nationalism starts to become much more mainstream um, in India and uh, the political party associated with it starts to um, become part, a part of coalition governments um, and actually holds some power. Um, and one of the things that the Hindu nationalists do whenever they're in power is immediately the ministry that they are most interested in is the education ministry. And the reason that they care about the education ministry the most is because the education ministry determines how textbooks are written, particularly history textbooks. Right. So to echo um, what was said about the importance of the stories we tell ourselves, right? the Hindu nationalists know this and right away, that's what they want to work on. So they have their own network of schools that they run across India um, for which they produced this highly biased um, story of, um, of India um, in which Hindus are constantly being victimized by outsiders um, and kind of need to become um, aggressive in order to protect themselves um, and to, to sort of regra regain their pride. And, um, and then they start trying to have this history be adopted um, by all schools in India. And uh, the government in power right now is a Hindu nationalist uh, government. It is um, electorally really dominant. Um, so it has, uh, it, it's able to push through what it wants. Um, while it's been in power the last, um, it came into power in, in 2014, it won the elections and then, and then won another set in 2019. And since then, um, Muslims in India particularly have really felt um, themselves to be under threat in lots of different ways. So it's been done through uh, passing certain types of new rules and regulations about um, like how uh, someone's citizenship is determined, how they get identity cards, um, which are like the social, uh, like social security cards. Um, and uh, also through sort of vigilante violence against Muslims, which basically the state turns a blind eye to, um, or in fact, uh, in some cases has then elected people to office who engaged in this kind of violence. Um, so, uh, so it has this kind of weird uh, origin and uh, many people continue to argue that the reason that um, so many uh, Hindus are uh, supporting this ideology and supporting this political party right now 
is because in the past 30 years, there's also been a huge shift in um, caste relations. So uh, people from historically dominated castes have become much more assertive, much more um, able to um, organize themselves and demand, um, you know, not not just uh, sort of rights, but also um, are making demands for justice. Um, and uh, sort of historical reckoning with um, the ways in which they have been marginalized. And so um, support for Hindu nationalism is often sort of a response to that. Um, I want to take like a couple minutes to pivot away from India and just talk about Hindu nationalism in the diaspora. Um, Hindu nationalism has made its way into the, the diaspora. It's in America and many, many um, People uh, of Indian origin have been shaped by Hindu nationalism, often without realizing it. So migration to the United States from India has been heavily skewed um, in terms of being upper caste. And um, as a result of that, uh, often people uh, who are, you know, like second and third generation Indians and who are searching for a sense of identity and belonging um, will connect to Indianness through their temples and through um, uh, their Hindu identity. And they don't always understand what that means um, and how, uh, you know, a Hindu identity is being constructed, right? It's not just something that exists out there. So um, like there's a story that has to be told about what makes you Hindu or not. And right now, one of the things that like the Hindu nationalists organizations in the US are really trying to encourage people to do is instead of identifying as Indian American, they want them to identify as Hindu American, right? Um, and so what they're doing is using kind of the language um, of multiculturalism and uh, religious pluralism as a way to um, legitimize themselves and advance their agendas. Um, and doing that is so that back home in India, they can, um, you know, be more uh, dominant and uh, more oppressive towards religious minorities. Um, so I think that's um, sort of one of the things to kind of watch out for and ask questions about. So it's only been fairly recently that like the South Asian Students Association on our campus stopped being the Indian Students Association and beca became the South Asian Students Association. So that's a little more inclusive, that's good, but most of their major events are still around um, Hindu festivals and um, and holidays, right? Um, and I'm not sure how many people within that group really think about and know the ways in which that signals an upper caste um, Hindu identity to um, what it is to be South Asian American, right? Um, and so anyway, um, I will stop there so that we have time for some discussion. Amazing, thank you guys so much. So um, uh, Declan and I have questions ready for you, but I think we're gonna just open up to the floor first. So if anyone has a question, feel free to react and we can um, and then you know unmute and ask your question or even write it in the chat. Yeah, and then I guess while that's happening, I can I can ask questions. So um, one kind of, um, I think there are two competing theories um, in kind of discussing the rise of um, white supremacy in specific, but also maybe in nationals where there's like a economic disenfranchisement theory versus kind of a status threat theory. I'm wondering for your two respective fields, like how you guys see those theories um, either compete or go together in explaining the rise of these phenomena. Mm -hmm. Good question. I think, I mean, you know, in the case of Hindu nationalism, at least, yes, I mean, it's both, right? So, um, and a lot of it depends on the context in which people are thinking. So there are people who support Hindu nationalism because they're thinking about India in the wider global context. And in that global context, India is one of the losers in the global capitalist economic system that's been set up, right? And India has to compete with countries like the United States and with China and so on. Um, and it's not doing very well um, in, that, uh, in that competition. And so uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which um, 
ideas about, uh, you know, like throwing off the yoke of colonialism, rejecting Western ideas about uh, rights and um, individualism and so on, it becomes very appealing um, where there's a sense that like, if we can only, um, you know, like buy Indian and um, like believe in ourselves, like we'll, we'll do better. Um, on the other hand, as I mentioned, there's also uh, like a lot of people who support Hindu nationalism as a way of um, responding to rising demands by um, people who have historically been marginalized and silenced. Um, so you get, you know, so Hindu nationalism is, is both kind of this rear guard action and also because India is a post-colonial society, right, um, which has had this horrible history of colonialism, um, also is able to tap into that sense of, yeah, India really did get screwed over um, historically by the West. And there needs to be um, some kind of like rebalancing over there. Yeah. And uh, thinking about the contemporary US context, um, there's certainly a, a percentage of, of the white American population that is fiscally motivated above all else. Um, but I think US history bears out that I think it's, it's the latter option, that like status weighs really heavily on the psyches of uh, Middle class white Americans. And I think it, we don't have to look even far back in history, although the examples are, are there also. I mean, Trump is mean to his own supporters, for instance. He, he, he uses a bully pulpit, he uses, uh, I don't know, figurative whips of various sorts, and that's empowering for his, his base. It's, he's not promising them the financial success that. He seen, may or may not have had himself. They, they are, he, he's promising them uh, entry into uh, a club, a status kind of thing that involves race and it involves masculinity. But I, yeah, I think what's so ironic about so much of US history is that with so much to do about capitalism, the, the majority of run of the mill white Americans seem perfectly content to have enough to get by so long as they feel some sort of mm, I don't know, I don't necessarily want to call it tribal because I don't I think that's clunky but some sort of group identity uh, and that has always I I think been more important for most of them than uh, economic concerns Thank you. So I think we have a question in the chat from Asgar. So um, he says, in recent history, have there been any major disputes or clashes between Hindu nationalists and Islamic fundamentalists in India? I think that's for you, Professor Dale. That's a really interesting question. <laughs> um, you know, because, uh, so in India, right, um, Hindus, especially if you count, um, like, uh, even people who uh, may not consider themselves Hindu, but the way that the, the sort of numbers are done, Hindus make up about 80% of the Indian population. Um, India has, uh, you know, the, the highest number of Muslims, I think, after Indonesia um, of any country in the world, but they're still only about 14% of the population, 13 or 14%. Um, so, like, the, the numbers are very lopsided, and in many ways, um, one of the kind of um, like surprising things about Indian um, history, uh, recent history, is um, is really the absence of Islamic um, fundamentalism um, uh, within India. So there's a very conservative uh, Muslim community for sure um, uh, that that is also quite powerful within um, within the Muslim community, but. Um, there hasn't been um, a lot of kind of militant mobilization, at least. Um, and so occasionally there have been, um, you know, like very rarely there's been some attacks, um, that, that some acts of violence carried out. Most of them are related to the conflict in Kashmir, 
um, and are not um, carried out by or um, sort of supported by Muslims in, in many other parts of the country. And some of it is just because most Muslims realize like there's not very many of them and they're not very powerful. And so, you know, like there's a vulnerability there and there's a sense of like, we can't actually, you know, like um, get up in arms because we will get killed. Um, the, the armed forces and the police aren't going to protect us. Um, so what we've had is, is uh, you know, like almost every year, there's some um, kind of attack by Hindu nationalists on Muslim communities. And so sometimes it's, um, you know, uh, th there's, there are various uh, sort of pretenses and pretexts for it. Um, it often is related to uh, upcoming elections. So a lot of research has shown that when um, elections are really competitive, um, in India, uh, that's when there's a much higher likelihood of there being um, violence carried out by Hindu nationalists um, against uh, Muslims. And um, and then it gets described as a riot, which makes it sound, you know, like it's both sides, but it's not really. I mean, these are, um, these are much more uh, often, you know, like a, a bunch of Hindus kind of beating up on a couple of Muslims. Um, and then sometimes there's, there's retaliation after that, but um yeah it's like this is not a like talking about this in terms of a conflict between two sides i think is misleading it's not really it's it's one bully um kind of picking on um on others awesome thank you so um i think i'm gonna throw a question to professor Driscoll because you just got one um so Professor Deo mentioned a kind of um, unconscious construction of Hindu identity in the diaspora, right, in America. Do you see a similar kind of thing going on in white Americans when it comes to white supremacy? I, I, uh, I guess I do. Um, I'm struck across uh, the data that uh, both of us are, are handling between the, the relationship between nation and religion. I think uh, that's something worth um, chewing on a bit. And um, it has, I mean, in the, in the US, there are still, I think today or yesterday, a uh, Fox News story I saw, well, the headline was something uh, to the effect of, I don't know, um, is the U.S. 80, this, that's what it is, 80% of the folks polled said that they believe that America is a Christian nation. And I think those kinds of topics are doing very similar work to the work that Professor Deo is describing is at work within Hindu nationalism. Yeah, without a doubt. Because we also have uh, lots and lots of data that suggests that uh, white Americans, uh, they continue to believe in God, angels, fairies, UFOs, you name it. I don't even mean that in a dismissive way. Um, Americans across the board, regardless of race or gender, we are a believing nation. Um, and what, we like to make use of that in so many ways. And I think that the, the issue or the, the identity of Christianity in regards to whether this nation is Christian or not has everything to do with the, the kind of work that Professor Day was describing is happening uh, to kind of battening down of the hatches of nation through a, a proxy or through a, a vector kind of case or identity in the form of, in, this, in the US context, Christianity. So we'll have a debate over Christianity as a way to really guide whether or not I can trust that you are of the same sort of thing as me. And this is a concept that's at least as old as the sociologist Max Weber, who was describing uh, white, American, uh, white Americans on the frontier out where I am now, but 100 years ago, he was saying that the way that they use religion is as a means of uh, procuring trust in one another. So if you tell me that you're Presbyterian, it does, I don't really care one way or the other what you do on Sunday mornings. I care whether I can leave my kids with you and if I'm in a bind or something. I care uh, in that regard. And I don't know uh, how effective that is, but I'm, I'm compelled that Weber was right, at least that that's, that's what's motivating a lot of the talk of Christianity. The, the 
topic that's been in the news for too many years at this point of whether a bakery shop can has the right to refuse service to uh, a queer couple who wants to get married and have a good uh, I don't know, wedding cake or whatever isn't really uh, about working out the details of that particular case. You know, it's about organizing the f folks who are talking about that issue in terms of who's in what camp or who feels like they are belonging uh, to what group. And um, I guess I'm starting to meander and ramble a bit. And so I'll, I'll shut up. But I certainly think that there are lots of lots of parallels between what's happening with Hindu nationalism and the uses of uh, the identity, the uh, salient identity of Christian in the U.S. context. Oh, I get, I can I'll also just double down on a point I made in the, uh, my presentation, which is that these were ostensibly synonyms for several hundred years. That's that's a historical point, and I think that that's where the relationship between race, nation, ethnicity, those all those different salient identifiers um, gets really murky. And I think we all ought to be as good at historians as we can be, because, for instance, uh, we only chart white supremacy back as far as the scholars go to the late Middle Ages, if not the early Enlightenment didn't exist before that, if you ask an expert. But 300 years prior to that, the same white people who will come to all of a sudden invent white supremacy were referring to North Africans not as Moors. We remember it on TV as Moor today, but that's not what it was. It was black a -more, and that was a direct reference to race. That happened it's from the 11th and 12th century onward. So they were a thousand years ago, literally, conjoining those concepts in a way that we're all of what we're describing and fighting over, I guess, I would situate as part of a secularization process where all of the things that used to mean other things have started to come unglued from one another. But as people do in such ingenious ways, even if they're sinister at times, they're able to uh, it re-engage these concepts in more fungible ways. So if I want to be a better Indian citizen, or if I want to gain the status of, uh, uh, I don't know, the best of the best Indian, whatever that might look like or be, I'm going to turn here to religion. Years and years ago, in say, a different context of Europe, that might not have been necessary, because if you were one thing, you were the other thing as well. But now there's uh, dexterity there that I think is fascinating as a scholar, but and there are times when it's uh, advantageous for your team, so to speak, and there are other times when it's obviously not. Yeah, so the final question is um, kind of focused for Professor Deo, but kind of based on some of the stuff that Professor Driscoll was talking about at the beginning on the idea of like the zealots within the white supremacist group and how that has kind of been wait, has been waning a bit over time. Professor Deo, I'm wondering if there's any things that you're seeing or that other people are seeing in um, the Hindu nationalist movement that might show that kind of the zealots in that movement might be waning to maybe hopefully give us a sense of a little bit of hopefulness at the end of this talk. Um, I think the news is bad on this. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's getting worse. Like, I think, um, you know, things that people would not say in polite company um, 20 years ago, they will say out loud today. So I think the discourse of Hindu supremacy um, and of um, Islamophobia um, in particular has really gotten turbocharged post 9-11, right? Um, like now, um, there's a way in which uh, Hindu nationalism is able to ally itself with um, the, the the powerful um, nations of uh, of the world. Um, you know, India and Israel are becoming really close friends, um, and a lot of that has to do with sort of who this imagined enemy is, right? Who the other is, um, and I think more and more uh, Indians are adopting 
um, really extreme views as common sense, right? They're reading these doctored textbooks and they're hearing the leadership say things and get away with saying things um, that wouldn't have been possible 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So um, they, much as I wish it was not the case, I think in India, things are going to get darker and worse um, before they get better. And I'm not sure how they're going to get better unless like we do something about it, you know? Sorry. <laughs> I hate ending on, on a sad note or a depressing note. Yeah, but the, I guess the truth is is good to some extent. Um, well, it, good to know at least so that we're all aware. Um, well, I think we'll call it there unless if there are any quick questions that anyone has. I, I think I have to ask. Okay, yes, so, go for it, go for it. So when it comes to just bringing some praxis, how do you guys think as scholars who study these movements that we should deal with Hindu nationalism, white supremacy, do they have different solutions? Or are they based in, you know, universal human values? So how would you guys approach these problems? Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, um, Chris, related to this. Okay, so I, like I, I've thought about this a lot. And like one of the things that Hindu nationalism thrives on is that there isn't really kind of a progressive Hinduism. Right? Like people who are into being Hindu are generally really conservative and um, really into hierarchy and domination and patriarchy. And there aren't a bunch of people who are like, we're Hindus, but we, you know, like are for equality and like, lot, you know, like being good and kind and taking care of like the weak. Um, and so I think many people, Sort of people who study Hindu nationalism basically say you actually just have to like get rid of Hinduism, right? Like to get rid of Hindu nationalism, like you just have to explode the category of Hindu altogether. Um, mm -hmm. That it's not a healthy um, religion, it's not a healthy ideology, and nothing good will ever come from it, basically. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's the same thing for whiteness, right? Like, is yeah. there a way to be a good, like, white person? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. I, th I think there is, but I think it's, it's complicated. I, I know uh, intimately the feeling of the frustration that you were describing for folks in regards to uh, Hinduism. I, I feel it so often with uh, Western monotheism, which I, is, I, I think has done, has done more harm than good, uh, but it's not going anywhere either. And so I think that the question of whether to remove Hinduism, whether to remove uh, Christianity or monotheism in general, it's not realistic. But I, I do think that there are ways that we can make better white people, for instance, or make better Brahmins, I, I don't know, what, fill in the blank, you know. And the, the way to do it, I'm, increasingly convinced that it involves stuff that we already have the resources for we're just not putting them in the in these kind of uh we're not turning to them in the right moments i think therapy i think ssris i think the ad uh, the advent of psychotherapy talk therapies of various sorts i don't think these are uh, i think we're in just the beginning of a moment when just to put it, speak to the context of uh, white Westerners, I think we're on the cusp of finally being better versions of ourselves than what we've been thanks to these modalities. And these modalities are changing over and over, I think. Uh, but this is a complicated thing because I also include uh, amongst this meditating. I'm teaching a class on mindfulness right now. I absolutely love that Lehi offers me the latitude to do this. And, but so much of that class uh, a cynical viewpoint might say it, you're appropriating Buddhist traditions of one sort or another. I don't think, I, for reasons we don't have time to get into, white folks are the folks who have never had a point of origin to form an identity. There's a reason that we always seem to be taking other people's things is because we don't have anything of our own in essence. That's not to criticize us as white people. That's a historical point that I'm making. But it means that we have to be, I think, capacious and open our hearts in thinking about what fights we fight with white folks who might need to be pulled along. This would include me sometimes, maybe other times it doesn't, but 
Baldwin, I'll, I'll end with the, uh, a quote from James Baldwin, you know, he's telling his nephew, he's like, the terrible misery of, of your situation, buddy, is that you must love them regardless. And I think if the history of Western Christianity teaches anything, it's not a statement on love, no, that, that history teaches us that it has created a community of folks that may, may extend beyond white people. I don't know one way or the other because I don't study it in that way to, to know, but there is a, a, you could call it a spiritual crisis, although not everyone, that would make some people bristle. You could call it a sociological identity crisis or deficit, but there is a hole inside of white folks that needs to be filled with something. And I think Buddhism or meditation, mindfulness offers a positive example of that. But so rather than have a fight and piss off more white people say, oh, you're taking this, you're taking this, which is something that happens every day in America on Twitter and other places, you know, and the news media on both sides like feeds into the fury. Instead of doing that, we got to pick our battles. And, and that has to happen from a place of love, not to get all like uh, up in the air with it, but we have to have more space for the folks that that we disagree with and that we might not even like, you know? Um, and that I think is something that the Douglas Dialogues are doing a wonderful job to uh, really foster within the, the Lehigh community. And I'm happy to have been a part of that for a second time. I look forward to a third, I hope, if I haven't scared anybody off. Well, thank you so much um, for that, for this talk, Professor Driscoll, Professor Deo. This was, um, to say it was insightful would be an understatement. This was wonderful. Um, a really great start to the semester for our first speaker event. Um, for, uh, so thank you again. I guess everyone, if this was in the classroom, everyone would be applauding. Um, for the five Definitely. by 10 people, I wanted to throw in the form real quick that they just need to fill out. Um, but uh, just please fill it out by like 6.30 so that I know. Mm -hmm. um, who's attended and we don't, you know, not like sending it to your friends. Um, and then also if you're interested um, in joining our group me, just send me an email at DMC223 or throw your email in here and I can try to do yeah. that. We have uh, three more events this semester coming up. So they'll be fun. And if you wanna look out for them and just for, you know, weekly discussions, reach out to, to one of us. So yeah, so again, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you for the audience for coming. Thank you for the day of your school. It was an extremely informative and interesting event. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, friends. See you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.